This is a production of Cornell University. Yes, good morning, everyone. Thanks for coming. Uh, today, I'm excited to talk with you about a project that I've been working on for a couple of years now that was brought to us by New York State growers, both in the west and the east parts of the state. And that is about a fruit finish disorder called apple scarf. So before I dive into the actual project that I've been working on, let's see if you can spot what apple scarf is, because it oftentimes can be a bit of a problem. And let me minimize that. So we're all at our own screens, so you can peer really closely. See if you can even tell the difference, what is a scarfed apple and what isn't. Um, I oftentimes have uh, people who are, uh, we have problems noticing that. And let me just put on a laser pointer here. All right, I'll make it a little easier for you. Can you spot the difference now? So it should be pretty obvious now. It's, it's not the lenticels, it's not these little dots. It's not the changes in pigmentation that you see. These are two gala apples. Um, that's just natural in the development of the fruit. The big issue here is this hazy, in this case brown, and because the image has been flipped, uh, uh, characteristic to the uh, fruit surface, which is very uh, problematic at the fresh market value for fruit. Uh, basically, on a grocery store shelf, it's not going to be the beautiful red fruit that people want, and thus it is a big concern for growers in New York State when they go to sell their fruit at fresh market prices, which is a major driver for why people grow apples in New York in the first place. So a little bit about apple scarf skin. Um, it's really poorly understood. There's not a lot of research on this fruit finish disorder. Uh, it's purely cosmetic. There's no known impact on the nutritional value or disease susceptibility of the fruit. It's not cultivar dependent, um, meaning that you know, you're not, you, you, if you know, a grower picks the wrong red peeled fruit, they're just gonna be hit by apple scarf skin a lot. Um, it's just more commonly observed on red apples because the distinction between the red peel and the whiteness of the disorder is just in high contrast. Um, it's mainly problematic, I'd say, in New York with gala, since gala is widely grown here. So it's definitely something that we're looking at improving here. There is a solution for apple scarf skin currently in the, in the literature. Um, basically using gibberellic acid, a plant growth regulator, uh, PGR, made in regular intervals starting at petal fall, so early in the fruit's development. Um, this program is sort of costly though, it's gonna be around $200 an acre, uh, an acre plus the labor costs. Um, so growers are looking for ways to better use PGRs to better manage this fruit disorder. And that's where I came in. Um, just lastly, scarf develops during the first 60 days after bloom, that's that critical period where you can try to shut down this disorder. Uh, just for context, we're about halfway through that period right now. Um, in, in literally out in the field where we're doing this trial. Um, but in short, as the fruit is expanding in the first, you know, in those first 60 days, as the flesh is expanding, what's thought to be happening is that there's stress on the skin right here. Um, and that's leading to actual disruptions of the epidermis, which then light can refract off of, and that's how you get that white sheen of apple scarf. There's a number of things that are thought to contribute to apple scarf development. Um, and what I decided to focus on for my project was rainfall since New York gets plenty of it, uh, this summer accepting. So what I developed was, could instead of using a typical calendar-based program where you're going to use four applications of this expensive PGR, GA47, um, over the course of a season, could you instead only apply the PGR when you need it? And that is whenever there is a massive influx of water due to lots of rain. Uh, I should also note as an aside, it could be that it's not necessarily rainfall that's contributing to apple scarf skin, but could just be that there's this high humidity in the microclimate around the fruit, and that's actually going to be problematic. Um, that's for another experiment though. So with this case, we were interested in applying PGRs only when a certain rainfall threshold was met. So either at one inch of rain in a single event or an inch and a half over a 10 day period. Basically, again, saying that there's this influx of water, it swells the fruit, it causes stress on the peel, and that's where you see the disorder developing. And we tried this at a high and low rate under those uh, conditions. And then we also did a standard program just four times throughout the growing season uh, in those first 60 days. And what we found was sort of, uh, was sort of cool. And that is, is that rainfall-based programs worked. They reduced both scarf skin severity and frequency in our treated fields um, compared to the typical program. Uh, so, for example, in untreated fruit, we saw a severity around 30%, which is way over the threshold. Um, 15 to 20 is much more acceptable when the fruit goes off for grading for fresh market pricing. Um, so, if this is our standard program here, this is well under that threshold that you're needed to make money. 
uh, and our two precipitation-based programs also were able to meet that need in terms of severity. In terms of frequency, we saw the, the same thing, that there was a high frequency of fruit that were scarfed in the first place when you didn't treat your fruit. Uh, and when you compared your precipitation programs to your standard programs, you saw a reduction in how many scarfed fruit you saw over the course of the season. Uh, thankfully, the PGR, because it is a plant hormone, it's messing with the plant's development. We did not see any uh, biological impacts on like how the tree was growing, if the fruit was oblong or weirdly shaped, or if there was an issue with return bloom the next year. So we don't think that growers need to be concerned about implementing this program on their farms. And we're hoping that basically this can become an alternative to the current recommendations, that um, growers can use this program based on rainfall and less on the calendar-based program. We're in our second year of the trial right now. Uh, it, we've not had a lot of rain, so we're probably gonna do this for a third year, um, but stay tuned for updates. I would like to thank the Cox Lab. Uh, Anna, Maywa, and Katrin were instrumental in collecting a ton of data last year when we did all of this. Dan Olmsted's been instrumental for getting weather data to me uh, quickly so I can make my decision-making regarding sprays. And Susan Brown and Kevin Maloney from the Brown Lab provided a lot of the trees that I used for this experiment. Thanks so much for your time. This has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.